Over the last few lessons, we've talked about intubation pretty in depth. The next thing I really wanted to cover on this topic is about the technique for quickly and safely intubating patients called RSI. All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. My name is Eddie Watson, and my goal is to give you guys the confidence to succeed in the ICU by making these complex critical care subjects easy to understand. I truly hope that I'm able to do just that, and if I am, I do invite you to subscribe to the channel down below. When you do, make sure you hit that bell icon and select all notifications so you never miss out when I release a new lesson. As always, the notes for this lesson as well as all the previous videos are available exclusively to the YouTube and Patreon members. You can find links to join both of those down in the lesson description below. Also, don't forget to head over to icuadvantage.com or follow that link down in the lesson description to take a quiz on this lesson, test your knowledge while also being entered into a weekly gift card. As well as don't forget that you can help support this channel through the purchase of an ICU Advantage sticker. Uh, again, those are found at the website icuadvantage.com forward slash support link down in the description. All right, so let's start off talking about what is RSI. As I mentioned, there definitely are times when we need to get an airway secured quickly and as safely as possible. Uh, in these times, we use something that we call rapid sequence intubation or commonly referred to as RSI. So our goal with RSI is to rapidly intubate a patient while also minimizing the risk of aspiration during this intubation attempt. So this is to be used in patients who are high risk for aspiration, and this can be a result of them having a full stomach or having other risks of pulmonary aspiration as well. As mentioned previously, aspiration during intubation does put our patients at risk for pneumonia and ARDS. By utilizing RSI, we can quickly establish a secured and protected airway while reducing the risk for aspiration, things such as coughing, straining, and vomiting. And the use of RSI really is the standard of care for non-complicated emergent intubations. It's most often utilized in emergent and emergency trauma patients, and this is due to them being in acute respiratory failure or having an altered mental status and really unable to protect their own airway. Also though, patients who have high risk of aspiration, such as those with upper GI bleeds, would also be indicated for RSI as well. And then finally, patients who are assumed to have a full stomach, which could also include like laboring patients, that these would also be indicated for RSI too. So let's talk about the technique or the specifications of our RSI. And really, the RSI differs from regular intubation in a couple of key ways. So the first thing that I want to talk about is a uh, paralytic. And while this is not necessarily unique to RSI, one key component of our RSI is the use of a, a paralytic agent after induction with a sedative. That said, uh, unconscious patients can often be safely intubated without the use of a paralytic. The use of a paralytic, though, serves to relax muscles in the patient to help prevent regurgitation of stomach contents, as well as relaxing the jaw and neck muscles, really aiding in the intubation attempt. Succinylcholine is typically the gold standard for RSI as it has a really quick duration of action, about five to seven minutes. It is a depolarizing neuromuscular blocking agent though, and so this can and will increase potassium levels in our patient, and it's really contraindicated in patients who have hyperkalemia, and especially in burn patients, spinal cord injuries, and really other neurological injuries. So for those patients who can't actually receive sucks, we would use a non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocker such as becuronium or rocuronium. So these can be used, but we have to use them in higher doses to to really produce the rapid paralysis that we're looking for in this. But because of this, they're going to have a longer duration of action, which can pose a risk that I'll discuss in a minute here. Now, depending on the situation, uh, some providers may choose to administer this paralytic after the sedative medication has taken effect, or in more urgent situations, it can be administered immediately after the sedative is given. Sometimes in these cases, we're just pushing the medications without any flush in between, which I did talk about in that last lesson. And so another key difference with our RSI is in relation to the positive pressure test breath. So like other intubations, uh, if possible, we are going to try to pre-oxygenate the patient prior to the intubation attempt. 
Normally with intubation though, after we administer the sedative, but before giving the paralytic, we're going to give them a test breath with the bag valve mask, and this is to ensure that the patient can be properly ventilated. Now, utilizing positive pressure ventilation such as this, this does risk insufflating the stomach with air. So this increases the risk for regurgitation of stomach contents, and thus our goal with RSI is to limit this risk, therefore we do not do any test breath here. Now, we will have a slight delay between administering the medications, and especially with the use of a paralytic, and the actual intubation attempt. Typically, this is about a minute or so after the paralytic is given, and this is to allow enough time for the medication to have its full action. And so, like in the case of if we're using sucks, we're really going to wait until the muscle fasciculations have stopped for the patient. But because of this, there will be a period of apnea for the patient. We are going to continue to apply 100% oxygen, usually either via a mask or with the bag valve mask kind of doing a blow-by for the patient. And this can still allow for some diffusion of oxygen, but obviously we're not going to be ventilating the patient. So given that we'll have not attempted that test breath, if the intubation fails and we cannot easily administer breaths afterwards, our patient's going to be at risk for hypoxia and hypercapnia and potentially more serious complications such as coding as a result of that. All right, another key difference with RSI is something that we call cricoid pressure. This is something that's also known as the Selleck maneuver. And so the cricoid cartilage is actually the first tracheal cartilage ring below the larynx. And it's the only continuous cartilage ring that's below the larynx. And so, as you can see here, it can be found by, if you follow the neck down from the prominence of the thyroid cartilage, also known as the Adam's apple, until you feel the first depression. This depression here is actually our cricoid membrane, and then the cricoid cartilage is the next cartilage ring below there. So cricoid pressure consists of applying firm pressure with the goal really of compressing the esophagus and preventing any potential gastric regurgitation. The way that you do this is you're going to utilize your thumb on one side of the cricoid cartilage and then one to two fingers on the other side. You want to make sure pressure is not applied to the larynx or the thyroid cartilage. You can also use a second hand to brace the back of the neck, but this isn't always necessary. It's important though that we do have enough pressure to occlude the esophagus, but not too much because that can actually hinder intubation and we may need to actually release some of the pressure if that's the case. Usually the person doing the intubation will let you know if this is the case. Now there is an acronym to help when it comes to utilizing this technique and it's something called BURP, so B-U-R-P. The B stands for backward or posterior displacement, so we want to be pushing posteriorly on the patient. U stands for slight upward pressure. R stands for slight right displacement of the larynx. And then P is pressure basically to occlude the esophagus. And the timing of when to apply this cricoid pressure can really vary from provider to provider as well as situationally. Most often it's going to be applied as soon as the patient loses consciousness after administering the sedative. Ideally, though, pressure should be applied before then, as after about 15 to 20 seconds of administering the sedative, uh, the patient actually begins to lose their airway protection. So this pressure that's needed, though, is often uncomfortable for the awake patient. So one adaptation that we can do is we can apply some pressure, not quite the full pressure that we would do once they lose consciousness, and then just increasing that pressure as they begin to lose consciousness until we have the appropriate amount. That said, informing the patient of this and what to expect can really help in these situations as well. Now once applied, the pressure should remain until the ET tube has been placed, the cuff has been inflated, and then confirmation of that placement with our CO2 detection. Until we know that that airway is secured, we want to keep that pressure down there to prevent any possible vomiting and reducing that risk of aspiration. Once we know the airway is secured, then we're okay to release that pressure. Now, there are risks with using cricoid pressure, and this could range from inhibiting the intubation to rupturing the esophagus, as well as fracturing that cricoid cartilage ring. Now, many times when this pressure is uh, needing to be applied, oftentimes the, the RT is the one that's going to be assisting with this and doing this, but certainly not uncommon for the nurse to be the one applying this pressure as well. 
All right, and so those are the, the big key differences when we're doing a rapid sequence intubation for our patient. Just a couple things that we're modifying, and if you just think about it, the, the reason that we're doing this is because we're really trying to make this a quick intubation attempt, and we want to limit the risks of aspiration for this patient. They're a patient who's going to be at risk for possibly aspirating, which could cause further complications down the line, increased time on the ventilator, increased hospital stay, mortality, all that stuff. So we really want to try to do this stuff in these high-risk patients to reduce those risks. So I hope that you guys found this information useful. If you did, please leave me a like on the video down below. Uh, it really helps YouTube know to show this video to other people out there, as well as leave me a comment down below. I love reading the comments that you guys leave, and I try to respond to as many people as I can. Make sure you subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. And a special shout out to the awesome YouTube and Patreon members out there. The support that you're willing to show me and this channel is truly appreciated. So thank you guys so very much. If you'd be interested in showing additional support for this channel, you can find links to both the YouTube and Patreon membership down below. Head on over there and check out some of the perks that you guys get for doing just that, as well as check out some of the links to other nursing gear, as well as some awesome t-shirt designs I have down there as well. Make sure you guys stay tuned for the next lesson that I release. Otherwise, in the meantime, here's a couple awesome lessons I'm going to link to right here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day.